You just take a look at how much money you could borrow, right? And how much cash flow the company is taking this is uh, spinning off, right? If you can borrow money, let's say five percent interest, okay, and the company is putting off fifty million dollars a year in free cash flow, and the market cap of the company is eight hundred million dollars, how much money do you make out of that transaction? Two hundred million dollars. Minus transaction costs, right? You can borrow at five percent. Company's putting out fifty million dollars a year in free cash flow. You go to the bank, you take a billion dollar loan. Bank says, "There's your billion dollars, but make sure you pay us fifty million a year." You say, "No problem." You take eight hundred million of the billion. You buy out the company. You basically, put the company in a stable position, so it's going to keep on spending out fifty million dollars a year. The fifty million dollar a year pays off the bank note. You walk away with two hundred million dollars. That's what private equity guys like doing. And one of the things they don't tell you about private equity is that one of the reasons it's so successful right now is interest rates are so low. Just a lot of debt, cheap debt. Really. This is one of the reasons why it's harder being a small private equity firm because we can't borrow at the same rate as a KKR or a, a Vista or a Carlyle. They have very good credit. Can you aggregate? Can little firms aggregate and become big firms? Yeah. Sure. But then you lose speed, and that's what little firms like. No, but consolidate in terms of not like buying power, as you say, you know, uh, in, in terms of people, like, bank negotiation. Not really, because then what happens is, you know, three guys band together, one guy makes a takes a bank loan and defaults, and he screws the credit rating of the other two guys. You need one CFO, remember, common enterprise. You have no interest in having the other guy mess up. Oh, excuse me. So today, we went through three topics. We went through uh, rules, laws and rules, regulations and rules. And we talked about basically the laws that define public equity, right, and how you get around them. Okay, how you can raise money without having to register with the SEC. And there were a couple of ways that you could do that. Number one was Reg D or Reg A, basically two ways that you can raise small amounts of money. Or in the case of Rule 506, unlimited amounts of money without having to register with the SEC. Okay? So I have to file Form D, right, which says I'm doing a transaction, but I'm filing this form as notification that I don't have to register. I'm registering to tell you I don't have to register in the complicated way, which is Form S1. Okay? You can also do the intrastate offering exemption, right, which is to say that 80% of my business activities are in South Carolina. I'm only raising money from people in South Carolina. Let's but not have a civil war again. You still have to follow Blue Sky. Do you have to follow the laws of, of South Carolina? Oh, sure. Those well, state laws are infinitely simpler than federal laws. And the cost of compliance is much, much lower. Okay? Another way you can get out of it by having fewer shareholders. You have less than 300 shareholders. You don't have to make the, uh, the um, reporting requirements. Okay. Um, so those are the rules and regulations. Okay. Then we want to often talk about research. Okay. Most of the research rules are, con are contained under NASDAQ 2711. And basically the idea behind the rules uh, surrounding research is, is that you can't distribute your research to over 15 people unless you're licensed by the NASD. Or the exemption there is that it's part of an investment newsletter. Okay, you can get around it that way. A lot of people use that. Okay. The other thing about research was just good research practice. Okay. You can use uh, SWOT analysis. You can use modified quarters analysis. Whatever you're going to do, be systematic about it. One of the ways people get into problems, again, we talked about the blank example. Okay. If you go in there, you got a bad feeling about it. All right, I'll be sexist for a second here. Generally, women do better with their feelings, right? They just get a bad feeling about it, and they trust their feelings. Men think they're so clever, right? They've rationalized why they should do something, even though it doesn't feel right, right? It may sound sexist, it's true. I've seen this time and time again with female portfolio managers. Why did you do that? It's not right. They're women. You know, go with what works for you. But men are, no, I'm, it's all logical. I've laid it all out, and this is why I should do it. And then later you just feel so stupid 
because that was your first instinct was, no, there's something wrong here. And you talked yourself into it. Go with the belief and pressure. Okay? 70% of the time it'll serve you well. Okay? But be systematic about it. Sometimes people just have a list of questions that they want to ask and have answered about every investment. Okay? And if you take a look at the requirements for an S1, it's generally all the questions that anyone should ask. Ask about its operations. Ask about its officers. Ask about any material transactions. Right? And that's uh, research. Go through the research report, and we have a sample of the research report up on our website. I mean, it's 50 to 60 pages long. Um, but, you know, the idea here is it's a process. Each one of our research reports looks about the same. And then finally, we ended up with accounting. Okay, a couple things you need to know about accounting are so you know, your old three. Right, think of three as financial statements. Right, the statement of financial position. All right, historically called a balance sheet, but that's what it will be called: a statement of financial position. Then your statement of cash flows. Right, you've got your statement of comprehensive income, also called a P and L. Right, those are your big three. And within the big three, it's three ways of looking at three things. Your operating results, your investing results, and your financing results. Okay. Generally, on a for for private equity or for businesses, what you're worried about is the income statement and the P&L, right? Looking at the cash flow. You either want to look at the cash flow when it's put in the bank or when it's reported. Okay. Approval accounting versus cash accounting. But generally, for the market value of an entity, you're looking at the cash flow statement or the P&L. If you're looking at valuing an asset, like a real estate transaction, or one of those situations where the company is just defunct, right? Maybe you're buying it out of bankruptcy, asset sales, right? You're uh, what they call a rape and pillage investor, right? You just take a company, fire everybody, see if the pension's overfunded. I mean, there's lots of stuff that you can do out there, the Gordon Gecko types, right? It's all, you know, fair game. In, in, uh, Finance, right? You're just, you're just trying to make money, right? Just go out there, rip the company apart, fire all the hardworking husbands, and right, make sure the grandma gets the most for her, you know, shares of ABC stock, right? Because you're gonna. Well, but at least it um, tells you how much risk is involved. I mean, if the if the if the underlying asset is worth that amount of dollars, you can pay. Maybe slightly less, maybe keep the company running, get the set the company value straight. Investing, but right? at least you know you know that your 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 risk is not that great, or you can value an investment. Uh, you know. Uh, yes and no. I mean, there are all sorts of growth investors out there on the street that will tell you that growth has consistently, over the long run, outperformed value. And if you use that type of analysis with Google or Microsoft or eBay or Yahoo I mean, or all the rest of those. It won't make won't work with growth companies. Growth companies grow because they have great businesses. It has nothing to do with their asset cushion. Now what you're saying is true from a theoretical or financial point of view, right? But in the end, we're here to make money, okay? And generally you make money by investing in good businesses. Now there are turnaround specialists. They like broken companies. Why? Because they can buy them cheap, restructure them, and sell them for more, okay? But as a general rule, an operating business. If you take a look at, you know, a good operating company will have like a 30% net, right? So a dollar comes in and 30 cents is left over to put on the balance sheet or give to investors. That's a lot more than your 6% yield on a treasury bond, right? So a good company is generally what you're looking for, right? Um, and so we've ended up here at the end of the financial statements with trying to figure out how you would go about creating your own financial statement. So, um, do you follow, like when you put um, the financial statements together, do you follow the new way? Or oh, the, no, the we, used to, we use US GAAP, which right is the old way. The, the right. I, I just show you that because I think if you take a look at the way they're trying to change things, right. it gives you a better understanding of what you're hoping to get out of the current system. Right. What you're hoping out of the current system is breaking up the operating results, not taking look at the balance sheet. Right, so why, why is it that you don't use the new way? Because they 